guys, Mish here, and today I'm bringing you another video from the hammock because it's so nice outside, I couldn't bear to be stuck inside for any amount of time. Today's video is on a really cool study that just came out on how eating processed versus unprocessed foods affects the amount you eat and whether you gain or lose weight and your hunger hormones and cool stuff like that. So I got some really cool results for you today. And what these researchers did was they took both men and women who were just slightly overweight, BMI of about 27 on average, and had them eat two diets each for two weeks. And one of these diets that they did for two weeks was the ultra-processed diet. And that means they were eating pretty much entirely really, really highly processed foods, like the most junk foody things you can think of. And the other diet, which they also did for two weeks, was the unprocessed foods diet. So this was a whole foods diet, essentially. So things that resemble how they are naturally, like for example, eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and things that did not have to go through any industrial processing uh, before people ate them. And all of the participants did each of these diets in a random order. So half the people did the ultra processed diet first and then switched to the unprocessed foods diet. And then the other half of people started with the whole foods unprocessed diet and then switched to the ultra processed diet. And to make it clearer which diet I'm talking about, so I don't just say the word processed 10,000 times, I'm going to call the unprocessed food diet a whole food diet. And then I'm going to call the ultra processed food diet just the processed food diet. To clear things up a little bit. Especially since I know I talk fast, even though this feels like I'm talking really, really slowly right now. Like I have to be putting all of my effort into talking this slowly. I'm trying. And the participants were told that they could eat as much or as little of the food as they wanted. And the researchers provided them with three meals plus snacks that were available all day long. And the total calories they ended up being presented with each day was 5,500 calories. So they had as much food as they could possibly eat. And the researchers just told them, here's all the food you can eat, either highly processed or whole foods, and eat as much of it as you want. And not only is this study super cool because they're the first to manipulate eating processed versus unprocessed foods directly, but they actually match these two diets on a bunch of factors that are actually generally thought to be the reason why unprocessed diets are so much better, or whole foods diets are so much better. And some of those things that they kept equivalent between the two diets were fiber, sugar, fat, sodium, and calories. So those diets were not different in any of those factors in terms of what they were composed of and what was presented to the participants. And that's pretty crazy, but I'll get into more of that later and why it's so interesting and cool and crazy. And so any effects that we see in the differences between these two diets is therefore not due to their differences in fiber or sugar or fat or sodium or macronutrients even. So they kept all the macronutrient ratios essentially the same between the two diets too. And the craziest part was they actually matched the two diets for energy density. So like that's one of the biggest things that's thought to be a plus of a whole foods diet is that the energy density is lower and that's the amount of calories per gram of the food. If you eat a bowl of lettuce, for example, that's much lower energy density than a bowl of ice cream and in general processed foods just have a lot more calories per like volume and gram. And now for some results, they found that people ate about 500 calories more per day on average on the processed food diet than when they ate the whole foods diet. And the researchers wanted to make sure that this wasn't just something that happened at the beginning of the diet since maybe over time people gradually learned to adjust their intake to a processed diet and maybe they learned to eat less. But they found that even in the second half of the diet or the last week, people still ate 450 calories more on average in the processed diet than on the whole foods diet. And a common thing that people talk about with processed diets is that they make you eat more carbs. People say, oh, I don't want to eat processed food because I don't want all those carbs. But in this case, when people were eating the processed food diet, they ate more carbs and fat. And in fact, they increased their calories and their carb intake at breakfast and lunch, but not dinner. Whereas they increased their fat intake at every meal. So that was interesting. So it seems like eating processed food is leading to you eating more in terms of both fat and carbs, not just carbs. And interestingly, even though the two diets were matched in terms of fiber, and people ate 500 calories more on average on the processed diet, they didn't end up eating more fiber on average in the processed diet. So if you eat 500 more calories, but your fiber doesn't increase, that means you preferentially chose foods that were lower in fiber. So it seems like on the processed diet, people may have been actually choosing the foods that were lowest in fiber. And I think that's just a good example of what a diet high in processed foods does. It just, it kind of trains you to seek out 
the most palatable things, the things that are the least satiating, so you can just have higher energy density foods. So even though the two diets were equivalent in terms of how energy dense the foods were that they were offered, they chose the foods that were the highest energy density on the processed diet. And as a result, the average energy density of the food they ended up actually eating was higher in the processed food diet. So that was pretty interesting. Seems like people's choices led them to actually make the processed diet even worse than it was just in terms of what was presented. So let's say they could have decided to have a soda, which is pretty low energy density compared to some things, given that so much of it is water and it's about 150 calories for like a can. They might have chosen instead to eat like a sundae, which even if you had the same amount of liquid or volume is going to be much higher calorie because it's got a ton of fat in it. So it seems like they were really going for the processed food items that actually had more calories per amount. And the researchers included a lot of cool measures to look for reasons why people might have eaten more on the processed diet. And they had them rate their feelings on the different foods on a bunch of different scales. And they found that the two diets were rated the same by the participants, who actually experienced both diets, in terms of how familiar the foods were, so like if they'd had them a lot when they were kids or if they were weird and new, and how uh, pleasant the foods were, so how much they liked them, and also their feelings of hunger, their feelings of satiety, and their feelings of capacity to eat, or how much they thought they could fit like in their body, essentially. And so they rated feeling the same on all these things, even though they ate 500 calories more on the processed food diet, they felt just as hungry and just as satiated as people who ate 500 calories less on the whole food diet. And this is a great example of how you can actually lose weight while eating whole unprocessed foods and still feel just as satiated and like you have just as little hunger as if you were actually gaining weight on a processed food diet, which is pretty amazing to think about. And the food can taste just as good as the pleasantness ratings. And they also rated feeling just as satisfied, so even in a psychological way, they felt just as much satisfaction from their food when they were eating whole, unprocessed foods as when they were eating processed foods. And so we're still left with the question of, why did they eat so much more on the processed diet than on the whole food, unprocessed diet? And one possible reason seems like it might be the eating rate. So on the processed food diet, people actually ate more calories per minute, and also more grams per minute even, than on the whole food diet. So something about the processed food diet led people to actually eat more calories and more grams per minute. So it's not just the energy density difference that's explaining this, they're actually putting more mass of food in their bodies at a faster rate than a whole food diet. I'm thinking I'll do a separate blog post or video on this topic, but some studies have shown that increasing your eating rate by 20% can increase the amount you eat by 10 to 13 percent. Please comment below if you would be interested in a video on that. And now for the part that I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for, which is the weight results or what happened to their bodies as a result of these diets. And they found that on the processed diet, people gained two pounds on average over the two weeks, whereas on the whole food diet, they actually lost two pounds over the two weeks. And keep in mind, these people had all their food prepared for them. They didn't have to do anything to prepare it, and they were able to snack all day, and yet they still chose to eat less on the whole food diet, so much so that they lost two pounds without trying in two weeks. So therefore there is a four pound difference between the two diets over a two week period. Because when they ate processed foods they gained two pounds, and when they ate the whole foods they lost two pounds. And at least two pounds of that difference was fat. So they said that their method of estimating body fat actually tended to underestimate a lot in terms of how much of a change was due to fat versus fat free mass, but at least two pounds of that difference between the two groups was from a difference in fat gained versus lost. And unsurprisingly, their weight gain or loss was correlated with their energy intake. But it didn't explain all of the variance, it actually only explained 64% of the weight gain or loss. So their energy intake only explained 64% of the difference in their weight change, which is pretty interesting. So by calories in versus calories out, it should be explaining much closer to 100% if, if calories in versus calories out were true. In fact, by calories in versus calories out, which I'm now going to call CISO because it's easier, they should have only had a two pound difference between the two groups. A 500 calorie difference per day over two weeks should only lead to a two pound difference in weight overall, but they had a four pound difference in weight in this case. And that is our first clue that this study also goes against CISO, but I have much more interesting stuff coming up on that, which is always my favorite part of these kinds of studies. And another cool thing about this study is they also had the subjects go into a metabolic chamber for a few days during each diet, 
and they found that on the processed food diet, they actually had a lower rate of fat oxidation, even though they were eating more fat, probably because they were burning a lot less fat. So that's pretty interesting. And now for the fun little nugget of info I'm always looking for in these types of studies, which is the thing that breaks CISO and that the researchers are like, whoa, what happened? Like. It's really funny when the researchers are like, well, maybe our measurements are wrong, like, we don't know how this could have happened. So I love when they're, like, kind of as surprised by it as the mainstream media would be when CISO breaks. And so with their measurement of energy expenditure that they had from the metabolic chamber, for example, they found that on the processed diet, people were eating an extra 417 calories per day on average above how much they needed to eat. So they ate about 400 calories above the amount they needed to maintain their weight. And by CISO, they should have only gained 1.6 pounds over those two weeks. But in reality, they gained two pounds. So that one might not break CISO because maybe it's just water weight or something. But the one that's really crazy is that they actually measured that when people were eating the whole foods diet, they actually still ate about 100 calories more than they needed to maintain their weight according to their energy intake versus measured energy expenditure. So they overate technically by 100 calories when they had this free buffet from the study but they still lost two pounds over two weeks. Guys, we broke CISO again. I love science. And this, my friends, is a great example of how CISO is just a heuristic and not actually a rule that governs how our bodies work. It's nice for estimating stuff sometimes, but boy, does it break a lot when it really matters. And the researchers calculated that to lose the amount of fat that they did, according to their body composition calculations and measurements that they did, the people eating the whole foods diet would have had to eat 220 calories below maintenance, according to CISO, in order to lose the two pounds that they lost. But instead, they were eating 100 calories above. And you could say, well, maybe their measurements are bad for energy expenditure. Let's say the energy expenditure thing was off by 15%, such that people on average tended to burn 15% more than their energy calculation thing expected. Well, then by that logic, we would be able to explain the weight gain in the process group even less. So any way you cut it, there's no way to explain the difference between these two groups, calorie expenditure and calorie intake and weight gain and weight loss, according to CISO. It just wouldn't work. And of course, the question is why in the world does this happen? Like, how could that have happened? And one reason the researchers think is that when you eat fiber, there's evidence that it actually decreases the amount of calories you can get out of everything you eat, which is really fun. I'd actually never heard that before. And so I think this also deserves another video. Please comment below if you're interested in that one. Sorry, I know I'm always floating video ideas, but I want your opinions on what's interesting. So yeah, there's some evidence that when you eat insoluble fiber, especially, it actually decreases the amount of calories you get out of all your food. So like if you had a really high fiber salad, and you paired that with like a burger and a milkshake, you would actually get less calories from that burger and milkshake. That's a very good argument for a whole foods plant-based diet if I ever heard one. And they calculated, based on what they gave their participants, that maybe it's possible that the participants actually had 330 calories less than they ate that was actually metabolizable. So for example, let's say someone ate 2,000 calories in a day. With all the fiber they ate, they could only actually digest about 1,670 or around 1,700 of the calories they ate. So that means 300 calories were just gone with the wind, gone with the fiber, which is a beautiful thought. And importantly, the fiber from the unprocessed whole food diet was mostly from insoluble fiber, whereas the fiber from the processed food diet in this study was mostly from soluble fiber, which does not give that benefit of making your calories just fly away and not be digested. And this explains a lot because I often eat about 100 grams of fiber a day just because I love my potatoes and my veggies and my fruits. And that might explain why I can randomly lose weight without trying so frequently when I start eating more veggies. And so now to another crazy part, which is the fact that these researchers actually match the two diets on pretty much all the factors that people have pointed to as possible reasons for gaining weight on processed food and losing weight on unprocessed food, which is fiber and sugar and salt. Like there's even this book I had to read in college called Salt, Sugar, Fat where the author pretty much blames all of obesity and weight gain and all our problems on the fact that salt, sugar, and fat are hyper palatable, which means you want to eat more of them and it's really hard to turn off your eating mechanisms once you start eating. With, like, it's hard to tell how satiated you are. But these diets were equivalent in the amount of salt, sugar, and fat that were available. So that means people gained and lost weight between these diets and ate a lot more on the processed food diet and it wasn't because of sugar, fiber, fat, or sodium, or macronutrient ratios overall. So it wasn't even a high carb versus high fat diet, like I often talk about, but it was something else. 
and the researchers aren't sure, but it could be because they differed in insoluble versus soluble fiber, like I just talked about. And also the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was higher in the processed food group. The processed food group ate more saturated fat, which is the type of fat that most commonly is found in animal-based foods. So that is the major source of saturated fat is meat and dairy and eggs. And another thing that differed between the two groups in the end was the added sugar as a percent of total sugar. So in the processed food group, a lot of their sugar was coming from fake processed added sugar like in sodas, whereas in the unprocessed or whole foods group, they were eating sugar as part of like fruit. And so I've gotten a lot of people asking me the question, well, what about fruit sugar? And this study seems to at least be some nice evidence that fruit sugar may be okay. But it wasn't clear which difference between the two diets was the big one that made the difference because these were a few things they identified, but there could be tons more things we just don't know about yet. But a possible mechanism or reason why the whole foods diet led to eating less and losing weight was that it actually increased the levels of an appetite suppressing hormone, PYY. And the levels of this appetite suppressing hormone increased on the whole foods diet compared to both the processed diet and to the baseline. So what people were eating before they even started these two diets. So it seems like there's something about eating whole unprocessed foods that actually suppresses your appetite on a biological level. And they also found that the whole food diet decreased participants triglycerides and their cholesterol compared to the processed diet and the baseline. And don't get me wrong with this video, I like my processed foods sometimes. Like, since I am a staunch believer in intuitive eating, I think that you should eat what you're craving generally, but try to gently nudge yourself towards eating more unprocessed whole plant-based foods. It's kind of a tangent, but one fun thing about a vegan diet is that even the processed foods are less processed than the processed foods you can get on an omnivore diet. In general, vegans tend to be more health conscious because a lot of people go vegan for health, and therefore vegan companies or companies that make vegan products tend to not include as many preservatives or as much processing because it is more appealing to vegans. So therefore, even your vegan processed foods is probably going to be a lot better for you and not even up there to the ultra processed foods level according to this study than omnivorous processed foods. So the best diet for losing weight seems to be an unprocessed, whole foods, plant-based diet, according to all the studies I've been researching and telling you about. I fully believe in eating fun, processed junk sometimes, but making it a habit to eat unprocessed whole foods, whether it's for health or for weight loss. So thank you for watching, and I hope this study was as interesting to you as it was to me, and I hope you enjoy my new hammock background. Please drop a comment if you have any opinions either way on my filming location, because I want to make sure you can actually hear and understand the stuff, but boy do I love this hammock. I love it so much. And if you want to support me, please like, share, or subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Just hit the subscribe button below if you'd like to see more videos and keep up. And of course, there's my Patreon if you want to donate. I also actually added some fun tiers to my Patreon because I realized I was just having it donation-based because I'm not very savvy sometimes with these things, but I noticed most people have like tiers and rewards to make it fun. So now I've added a community on my Patreon where for like different tiers, you can either get fe featured on my website, like with your social media handle if you want some advertising. Also the ability to ask me a question every month and have it answered either in a video or with scientific research that I find and just answer to you personally, plus monthly group hangouts via video. So if you're interested in any of that, please check out my Patreon. So thank you for hanging out with me during my hammock science time. And I hope you will join me next time.